Amen. All right, here in 1 Timothy chapter number 4, I want to focus in on a specific charge or admonition that is given unto Timothy from the Apostle Paul. I want you to look with me there. We'll begin reading in verse number 11. The Bible says this, These things command and teach. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word and conversation and charity and spirit and faith and purity. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Specifically, verse number 14, it says this. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Notice it says, with the laying on of the, hand, the hands excuse me, of the presbytery. Now, the word presbytery in the Bible, you can look it up in a dictionary if you'd like. And I'm going to actually prove this to you later in the sermon. We're going to come back to this. It means elder. That's what it means. It means elder. Now, uh, we are going to be discussing one more time this morning something related to the subject of church leadership. And the title of the sermon this morning is Ordaining Officers into the Church. Ordaining Officers into the Church into the church. So we're going to be going over, it's going to be very doctrinal, uh, the subject in the Bible, the doctrine in the Bible of ordination, ordination. Now I want you to turn with me to John chapter number 15, John chapter number 15, John chapter number 15. We're going to start off very simple here this morning in defining the word ordain. That's what we're going to do first. There are a couple of definitions to the word ordain. We're going to get very specific after this. First, I want to look at the more of a loose definition, more of a very vague definition of the word ordained. So John chapter number 15, verse number 16. This is Jesus speaking unto his disciples. John chapter number 15, verse number 16. He says this, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Now notice this. And ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. That you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. So notice there at the beginning of that verse, he says, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And then he repeats himself once more, and he says, And ordained you. So a very loose definition of the word ordain means to choose. It means to choose. Now, specifically, ordain most of the time in the Bible is used... To, to, uh, 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 to, get, to convey the thought that you are choosing someone for a work to do. And that's exactly what we see right here. We see someone being chosen to do a specific work. Notice, to bring forth fruit. So they're, they're, they are chosen by Jesus or by God here. And notice it also says they are ordained by him, right? What for? To bring forth fruit, right? It is they are chosen for a specific work. Now, I want you to go to Acts chapter number 1 with me. Actually, first go to 1 Timothy 2. Sorry, go to 1 Timothy chapter number 2. I'm going to have you go to two places at the same time right now. I want to give you a more specific uh, definition of the word ordain. 1 Timothy chapter number 2. We're going to look at verse number 7. Go ahead and get that in your left hand. Once you have that, go to 2 Timothy chapter number 1 in your right hand. This is 2 Timothy chapter number 1. Uh, and 1 Timothy chapter number 2. So first look with me here at 1 Timothy chapter number 2, verse number 7. The Apostle Paul speaking, he says this, Whereunto I am ordained, a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not. And then he says, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. Notice the Apostle Paul says, Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. Okay, he says he is ordained as a, a preacher and an apostle. And he also says a teacher, right? Because an apostle is a preacher and a teacher. That is his job as an apostle. I want you to go over with me to 2 Timothy chapter number 1 now. I want to compare scripture with scripture. Uh, you'll see the importance of comparing scripture with scripture right here. We're going to define the word ordained further. Be more specific with the word ordained. Look at 2 Timothy chapter number 1. I want you to look at verse number 11. Verse number 11. Almost the same exact statement here. He says this. Whereunto I am appointed, whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle, a teacher of the Gentiles. You'll notice it's almost the exact same statement. It's almost verbatim. But one word is exchanged out or synonymous for another word. And what is it? He says he was ordained in one passage. And then he says appointed. Now those three words technically are 
are almost exactly synonymous. Now, I'm going to get into the differences here in just a moment, but a very simple definition of the word ordain is to choose, right? It is to choose. A more specific definition of the word ordain is to appoint. Because why? When they chose someone in John chapter 15, or Christ chose someone, what did he do? He chose them for a work. Now, we're talking about giving someone a job, you know, or giving someone, you know, a task or, or some sort of work. We would normally use, hey, I'm going to appoint you to this work, right? We wouldn't say, I'm going to choose you out and put you over this work. We would use the word appoint because oftentimes it entitles an office, right? That very often in the Bible, we'll see when someone is given a type of work to do, there's some sort of office that is connected with that or associated with that. That's what we see here. We see choose a very loose definition, and then we see appoint. So they are appointed to this office. Just like Paul says, he's, he was ordained as an apostle, he was also appointed as an apostle. I want to demonstrate this to you one more time. Go to Acts chapter number one. The book of Acts, go to Acts chapter number one. We'll see again, speaking of a specific office. So we saw in John 15, who was he speaking to? He's speaking to his disciples. He's speaking to his, his apostles. And he says, I chose you. And he says, I ordained you. Notice these are people that are being ordained into an office of the church, right? Then we see Paul saying it, right? And what is he? He is also an apostle. So he says, I was ordained an apostle. And then he also elsewhere making the same statement. He says, I was, an appoint I was appointed as an apostle. So what does it mean? Ordained, it means to be appointed or it means to be chosen for this position or for this office. I want you to look with me here. Acts chapter number one. Look at verse number. I want to back up because I want to focus on something else quickly. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because everyone's pretty familiar with it. Look at verse 15. We'll read down through here pretty quickly because I don't have a ton of material for this morning. Look at verse 15. It says, And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, The number of names together were about 120. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us, now watch this, and had obtained part of this ministry. Now what does ministry refer to? It refers to work, doesn't it? He obtained part of this ministry or of this work. Look at verse 18. Now this man purchased the field with the reward of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. That's pretty graphic. Look at verse 19. And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, insomuch that the, that field is called in their proper tongue a seldoma, that is to say, the field of blood. Look at verse 20 now. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric let another take. Now, what is the position that Judas was in? He was a apostle. But notice what it's referred to here. This is, we can learn a lot from this. What? It's a bishopric. So what does the word bishop mean? It's an overseer, right? So the apostles were what? They were considered overseers. They were considered the office of an apostle was also the office of a bishop, which just means overseer. That's what that means. So notice it says, let another take. So there it says, and his bishopric, let another take. Verse 21, wherefore of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, verse 22, beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be, notice this, ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. So notice that it's very important that this person be ordained. Notice he uses the word must. Must one be ordained. Now what does the word ordained mean? It means to be appointed. And this is a ministry or this is a work. So it says must one be ordained. So is it optional to be ordained into an office? It is not, is it? Must one be ordained. So that's one thing that I want to start with here, that it is necessary to ordain someone into an office. It is necessary that they be ordained into an office in the church. Amen. Now, we're told of different offices in the church, and I'm going to focus on the two that are relevant to us current day or modern day, but there used to be two additional offices. There used to be four total, which was at the top, apostles, so first, apostles. The Bible says secondarily, prophets, and then below that we would have pastors and deacons to be specific if we're going to name the offices themselves, right? So I'm going to get into the two offices that are relevant to us today. But 
pretty much everyone would agree that pastor, I'm sorry, apostles and prophets do not exist anymore today. They died off, right? Uh, apostles and prophets are people that saw the Lord and that were there with the Lord. And even more so, they were sent directly or personally by the Lord. Every time in the Bible, apostles are sent by the Lord or prophets are sent in the Old Testament, God comes to them, he has a specific job for them, and he himself ordains them and sends them forth to do this job. Notice here that it is necessary for an apostle to be ordained. It's not optional. You must be ordained. It says must. Now, notice further it says this. Must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection? Verse 23, watch this. And they what? They appointed to... Jo I'm sorry, they appointed two. Joseph called Barzabas, who's, who was surnamed Justice and Matthias. And then it goes further on, uh, skip down to verse number 25, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas, Judas by transgression fell. So notice that the apostleship is basically the same as the bishopric. Not only that, if we would have read, we, we skipped over to verse number 24. We'll read that real quick. It says, And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast what? Chosen. So they chose out two men that they thought were good, right? And what word did he use there? Appointed. But then he says, specifically, they want God to appoint one of these two in which would step into this office. So what is the definition, again, of the word ordained? We see chosen, and then we see what? Appointed once more. So that's what it needs. Now, keep that in mind. It is necessary, it is necessary that one be ordained into an office. God has established specific offices in the church, and he did so also in the Old Testament. I want you to go back to Psalm chapter number 109, verse number 8. Psalm chapter number 109, verse number 8, because it was a quotation that we just read. <clears throat> Psalm chapter number 109, verse number 8. This is a word we're going to see brought up that's associated with these particular positions over and over again. The bishop, the deacon, also the apostle and the prophet, because these are offices within the church, two of which, as I said, are relevant to us today, and two of which are not relevant necessarily to us today, because there are no apostles and prophets specifically in those offices anymore today. So we saw that his office, Judas that is, was referred to as a bishopric, right? It'd be like the office of a bishop. That's what the word prick means. Now I want you to look there in Psalm number 109, verse number 8, and I'll prove that to you further. Psalm chapter number 109, verse number 8 is where that was quoted from. It says this, let his days be few, watch this, and let another take his office. So notice a bishopric is an office, isn't it? It is a ministry, so you do work, but it is specifically referred to as an office. I want you to turn with me to the Old Testament now. We're already in the Old Testament, but uh, further in the Old Testament, go to 1 Chronicles chapter number 19. 1 Chronicles chapter number 19. I want you to look with me at some of the offices of the Old Testament. Because everyone, of course, would acknowledge as well that there were specific offices of the Old Testament, some of which do not exist today any longer, right? The priesthood is done for. They're, 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 it is not um, active today. The temple is not here today. So there is no priesthood that's going on today. There is no office of a priest today. But there were particular offices, and this was a ministry that they, that they waited on, right? And so we're going to see that real quick. I want you to notice the same pattern. Look at 1 Chronicles chapter number 19, verse number 22. That is not right, because there is no verse number 22. Go to 2 Chronicles chapter number 23, verse number 18. Shoot. 2 Chronicles chapter number 23, verse number 18. 2 Chronicles chapter number 23, verse number 18. 2 Chronicles 23, 18. This better be right. Look at verse number 18. The Bible says, Also Jehoiada appointed, watch this, the offices of the house of the Lord by the hand of the priests, the Levites, whom, whom David had distributed in the house of the Lord to offer the burnt offerings of the Lord, as it is written in the law of Moses, with rejoicing and with singing, as it was ordained by David. I want you to go to Numbers chapter number 3. Verse number 10. Numbers chapter number 3, verse number 10. Let me see if that was 2 Chronicles while you turn there. Nope. 
was not, I don't know what happened there. So Numbers chapter number 3, verse number 10. We're going to see this again. Notice that it said that they were appointed into this office as priests. Numbers chapter number 3, verse number 10. We're going to see this once more. Numbers chapter 3, verse number 10. The Bible reads, And thou shalt appoint Aaron and his sons, and they shall wait on their priest's office. So notice they're put into an office, and what happens? They are appointed. Man, that verse was super uh, important because it actually used the word ordained. And we we're going to see that these, that these two are used interchangeable when it comes to the priest being put into an office. It'll say that they are appointed and put into that ministry or put into that office. And it also says that they are ordained. They are ordained and put into that office or put into that ministry. So another thing I want to point out to you is even in the Old Testament, there were qualifications for these positions. I want you to go with me to Leviticus chapter number 21. So this was an office that was in the Old Testament. This was a ministry that existed in the, under the Old Covenant, and they had qualifications in order to be put into this office. So the very first step before someone is appointed, before someone is officially ordained, and inducted into this position or into this office, they first have to meet these specific qualifications. Now, one of them uh, that, was, that was ordained by God in the Old Testament was that you must be of the tribe of Levi, right? You had to, of Levi, you had to be a Levite in the Old Testament in order to be a priest. So Leviticus chapter number 21, we're going to look at some of the other qualifications. There's quite a few of them. We're going to just kind of skim through here. Look at verse number one first. We'll begin. The Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto the priests, the sons of Aaron, and say unto them, There shall none be defiled for the dead among his people. So this is the behavior that they're supposed to have when they're in the office. But for his kin that is near unto him, that is for his mother and for his father and for his son and for his daughter and for his brother and for his sister a virgin, that is nigh unto him, which hath had no husband, for, for her may he be defiled. But he shall not defile himself, being a chief man among his people, to profane himself. They shall not make baldness upon their head, neither shall they shave off the corner of their beard, nor make any cuttings in their flesh. They shall be holy unto their God, and not profane the name of their God. For the offerings of the Lord made by fire, and the bread of their God they do offer. Therefore they shall be holy. Verse 7. They shall not take a wife that is a whore, or profane. Neither shall they take a woman... Put away from her husband, for he is holy unto his God. Thou shalt sanctify him, therefore, for he offereth the bread of thy God. He shall be holy unto thee, for I, the Lord, which sanctify you, am holy. So notice that these are specific qualifications for a priest. These are things that they should not do. Now, if they break these particular commandments that they're given, then they're no longer qualified to offer. And we actually see this taking place temporarily in the Old Testament. When they will, uh, uh, you know, there's a particular time when a man, you know, uh, one of his close to kin dies, and he actually goes and defiles himself, and he is not able at that time to wait on the office of his ministry. This takes place in the Old Testament. So they're disqualified for a temporary period of time. Furthermore, I want you to look at verse number 16 in this same chapter. Verse number 16, these are also more qualifications of the priests. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron, saying, Whosoever he be of thy seed in their generations, that hath any blemish, let him not approach to offer the bread of his God. What's it saying? What's the job of the priest? It's to go and offer these things, right? So what is it saying? It's saying that he's disqualified. It's saying that he's not allowed to wait on this ministry. He's not allowed to do this work if he it doesn't meet this particular requirement or qualification. So notice, this is an office that someone is appointed to, but notice that they are not allowed or they are not capable of being appointed to this office if they do not meet this qualification. Keep reading verse number uh, 17, uh, or verse 18. For whatsoever man he be that hath a blemish, he shall not approach a blind man or a lame or he that hath a flat nose or anything superfluous. 19. Or a man that is broken footed or broken handed or crooked back or a dwarf or that hath a blemish in his eye or be scurvy or scabbed or have his stones broken. Verse 21. No man that hath a blemish of the seed of Aaron, the priest, shall come nigh to offer the offerings of the Lord made by fire. He hath a blemish. 
He shall not come nigh to offer the bread of his God. So notice very clearly that if you don't meet all of these qualifications, are you uh, qualified for the office of a priest? You are not, are you? You are not allowed to wait on this ministry. You are not. God says you're not allowed to, to wait on this particular work. Now, of course, this is symbolism of the Lord Jesus Christ and him being sinless is the purpose of the, you know, these particular qualifications. You might look at these and say, man, that kind of, why, why are these the qualifications? Well, it's because this was only meant to be symbolism in a, in a major way of, as far as the blemishes and the scurvies. Just outward looks that were blemishes represent oftentimes sin. They'll talk about the blemishes of like a lamb or something like that. Those represent, of course, the lamb, you know, uh, uh, symbolically having sin or not having sin. They don't have those blemishes. But the point still stands that there were particular qualifications that you had to meet in order to be put into this office in the Old Testament. And what wording did it say when someone is selected or chosen? It said that they were appointed. And elsewhere it says that they are ordained into these offices. I want you to turn with me to Exodus chapter number 18. We're going to see this again. The judges or the rulers that were selected and put under Moses, there were qualifications. If they met these qualifications, then they were appointed or they were ordained. Now we're going to look here in just a moment to see what, by what means they are ordained and what actually takes place to make this official or to induct them you know, officially into this position. So I want you to look at Exodus chapter number 18, look at verse number 21. See these qualifications for the judges that were to be under Moses. It says, Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be ruler, rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties and rulers of tens. So notice when they had these judges that were going to be set over them, you know, the rulers of fifties, tens, all that, notice that they had particular qualifications. Number one there, it says that they must be able men. It says that they must... Fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness. So there are particular qualifications. What if you love covetousness? Are you qualified for this office? You can't be in this office, can you? Notice that they're referred to there as rulers. Another word that's used interchangeable with rulers all the time in the Bible is officer, right? Because it is an office. It is a particular position. You go out and you find these men. They prove themselves, right? They show that they are qualified, and then they're taken, just like a priest, if they meet the qualifications, and they are appointed or chosen or ordained officially into this office. But notice what has to come first. They have to be qualified, right? They must be qualified. Now, if you look at the context here, God is speaking unto Moses. God is speaking unto Moses, and he tells Moses to go forth and to find these particular men. Now, notice it tells him in verse number 21, it says, it says, Able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetous, covetousness. So, Moses is going to go out and he's going to find men based on what? God gave him these guidelines, but based upon what? Moses' judgment. Moses would go out and use the guidelines that God gave him, and he's going to go out and according to his opinion, he's going to find able men. He's going to go out and say, hey, I think that guy's able. I think he's an able man. He's going to go out and he's going to find men that fear God, such as fear God. According to who? God didn't say, hey, go get, you know, whoever. Uh, you can name anybody you want, Korah. Of course he didn't say that, right? But he didn't say, hey, go get Korah, and, and I want him to be. No, he said, Moses, I want you to go find able men, such as fear God, and then it says, men of truth hating covetousness. According to who? Moses, here's the guidelines. This is what I want you to do. I want you to go out and notice who he gives these qualifications to. Who? The leader. Who was the man that was set over the congregation? He gives it to a man that is already qualified to be a ruler. Notice that when, remember, and I'm sure this is very fresh in everyone's mind, but notice that when he, he puts Joshua into this position of being a man over the congregation, this is supposed to be the man that is a ruler. It says that they, that they would obey Joshua just like they obeyed him. These are rulers that are being put up, uh, uh, under Moses to actually do the job that Moses is doing on more of a minor scale. But when the major problems come, they come to Moses, and they bring this to Moses, right? So these are men that are rulers that are put under 
Moses. So Moses is selecting these men out, right? Moses is the one that's going to be selecting these men out. And notice that he's a man that's already qualified for this position. Now let me ask you this question. Does it make sense to have someone that's not qualified and say, hey, I want you to go find able men, men of truth, you know, such as fear God and hate covetousness. So why? Because these are good qualities that a, that a ruler would have. Now, if Moses is a ruler and he's in a position and God selected him, and these are God's qualifications, do you think Moses met those qualifications first? Of course. So wouldn't it make perfect sense that if God says, hey, you met these qualifications, I'm putting you into this office, that you can trust Moses' judgment when he goes for it? Because he, he's an able man. He's a man that hates covetousness. Covetousness, goodness sakes, hippopotamus is right? He, a man that hates covetousness, and he it fears God, right? So he's qualified because he has met these qualifications to go forward. Now, do you think that he would have given these qualifications, these guidelines? That was a perfect example. I, I said a moment ago to Cora. Hey, Cora, go do this. How about just to a bunch of people that aren't qualified? Does it matter how many people you have involved in this if they're not qualified? What about 50 Koras? What about 100? What about thousands of people that just aren't qualified? It doesn't make sense. Now, notice, another thing I want you, I want you to go with me to the New Testament now. Go to 1 Timothy chapter number 3. 1 Timothy chapter number 3. So the same thing happens in the New Testament. We have New Testament offices, right? So we're going to shift out from Old Testament to New Testament. There are New Testament offices that are, that are active today. Two of them specifically, a bishop and a deacon, right? A bishop and a deacon. And you know, uh, be it no surprise that there are qualifications to these offices. There are qualifications to these offices. I want you to look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 1. It says this. This is a true saying, if a man desire the, watch this, office of a bishop, notice this as well, he desires a good work. Now, we saw that they were ordaining people or appointing people to this ministry, right? To this work. And what was it? The bishopric was an office, which was also uh, looked at as, it said, his apostleship. So it was an ap apostle, was a bishop, which was an office that they did what? They did work, just like we see here. So notice now, let's look at verse 2. It says this, A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Verse 3, Not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, brawler, not covetousness, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. <clears throat> Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. So what did we just read? We just read qualifications for what? For a bishop. So can anyone be a bishop? No. There are specific qualifications in order to get into this office. So what ha has to happen first before you become a bishop? You have to be proven or you have to meet these qualifications. You must first be qualified. You don't become qualified later. You become qualified just like in Acts chapter number 1. They had certain qualifications and then once they found out hey, who's qualified for this, then we're going to appoint or choose or ordain someone into this position. What about the judges? They had qualifications. What about the Levites? They had qualifications. And once they found people that met these qualifications, then they're going to put this person into this office. I want you to go with me now. Actually, let's look down a little bit further. Look at verse 11. We'll keep reading. In 1 Timothy 3, I want to show something else to you. Here's the second office. It says in uh, verse 8, Likewise must the deacons be great. So notice this is another office. And I'll prove that to you. Not double tongue, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre. Holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. Verse 10. And let these also first be proved. What does that mean? They need to prove themselves. They need to first be qualified and prove that they meet these particular guidelines, these particular qualifications. Watch this. Then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. So notice that it says also 
first be true. So that means that the bishop also has to be proved. So in the same way the deacon has to be proved, the bishop has to be proved. And then the second thing that we see there is that it is an office. Keep reading. Verse number 12. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children in their own house as well. Verse 13. For they that have used the office of a deacon well. Notice again that this is an office. This is an office that you would be appointed or ordained into. According to Acts 1, the Bible teaches that one must be ordained into an office in the local church. I want you to go now to Titus chapter number 1. We're going to see qualifications again. Titus chapter number 1. And then we're going to add the third step. So we see, first we saw the definition of the word ordain. What does it mean? It means to choose. More specifically, it means to appoint to an office for a particular work, right? This office has a certain work. Just like the office of the priest, they had a certain ministry, right? Each one of the Levites, they had different work that they were supposed to do, right? So that was the first thing that we saw. Then, just now, we saw that there were qualifications before you're put into this office. There are certain qualifications before someone puts you into this office. Look here at Titus chapter number 1. We're going to see more so elaborated the qualifications of a bishop. Look at Titus chapter number 1, verse number 4. It says, to, to, to Titus, my own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Verse 5. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. Now, I want you to remember, if you recall back to Acts chapter 1, notice that they said we, it, we must ordain or it must need to be that we ordain someone to this ministry. You notice that? They're going to be ordained to a ministry. What do they say they're doing here? Ordain elders in every city. So notice ordaining someone to a ministry like we read in Acts 1 Comparing scripture to scripture here, it says we're being elders. So what does that kind of you know, imply there? Obviously, this is just a supporting verse. But what does that kind of imply about an elder? That maybe it's a work or maybe it is a ministry that one would be ordained into. But it says, and ordain elders in every city as I have appointed thee. Verse 6. If it be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. Then he says this in verse 7. For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate. And then he goes on, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, and so forth and so forth. So notice what we have here again is what? We have qualifications for a bishop or qualifications for an elder is what we have here. Now, furthermore, we see the qualifications, but notice what has to happen. There has to be elders that are ordained in every city. So after one meets the qualification, what happens? They are appointed or they are ordained into this office. Now, I want, I want to show you real quick how is the ordaining, how does that actually take place? By what means? And I'm going to demonstrate that it is by the laying on of hands. I want you to go now with me to Acts chapter number 6. Acts chapter number 6. Acts chapter number 6. So we saw the qualifications of a bishop and a deacon given in 1 Timothy 3. Right here in Acts chapter number 6, we see uh, deacons actually put into a position or, 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 I'm sorry, or ordained into a position. Acts chapter number 6, look at verse number 1. It says this, And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. So the Grecians, those that are within the church of the Hebrews, of the Jews, of you know, Peter, uh, James, John, all the disciples, they, their widows were being neglected because of if you will, the daily ministration, the work of the Lord, that the, they're going out and preaching the gospel, prayer. He mentions here in just a minute, word of God and prayer, right? So the, the Grecians, their, their, their uh, widows aren't being waited on, right? They're too old to take care of themselves. They don't have a husband to take care of them. And they're not being helped or they're not being waited on, right? And they're getting upset and there's a stir within the church 
among the Grecians because they're complaining about this. Look at verse 2 now. Then the twelve, that's the apostles, of course, called the multitude of the disciples unto them. So they called the disciples unto them and, says, and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Verse 3. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Now, who? I want you to notice a couple of things. Because people try to turn to this passage and say, Well, see here, you actually have now the whole congregation that are going to be, you know, uh, um, choosing out these people to be qualified. Now, there's a couple of problems with that. Number one is that the 12 disciples were not the only uh, bishops in the church. There were a lot of other rulers because there are, these are just 12 of the disciples, but there were a lot of other apostles outside of 12. There was 70 that he ordained also besides this. Not only that, the, uh, the church that they're located in specifically was the largest of them all. I mean, we just saw 5,000 people being added right before this. The Bible says that there are apostles, prophets, secondarily, there were pastors. So there were also bishops within this church that were not apostles and that were not prophets. And you can, by comparing scripture to scripture, see that there were other, there were other prophets that were within the church as well. So there are other prophets, there are other bishops, there are other apostles even. So the twelve, though, specifically say they're more of the, the higher up leadership. They say, hey, you guys go find, uh, uh, you know, um, I'm sorry, uh, men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. And then he says this, notice, this is a, important, whom we may appoint over this business. So who is going to be the one that actually makes the final judgment call or appoints them over the business? It's going to be the disciples. Now, what's the reason why they say, hey, you guys go do this? And remember, there are many other apostles, so it's not just, just the layman or just the congregation. But of course, they are. you are also proved by the congregation to a degree. The final judgment comes from the one, someone that has already been ordained themselves. But the congregation also proves someone that is going to be ordained. That is a fact. But here, when we see in verse number 3, they send them forth. But what was the whole reason why this, this issue arose in the first place? What was the reason? Because they were saying that they were too busy, that they did not have time to do it. So doesn't it make perfect sense that they're like, hey, you guys go find us, and then we will, we at the end will be the final judgment call, and we will appoint them over this business. So you can see how this is working out very clearly. Look at verse 4. He says this. Notice that the, the, I, I can further prove that to you. Verse 4. He says, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer to the ministry of the word. Verse 5, and the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Procur Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. Now watch this, verse 6, super important. Whom they set before the who? The apostles. So they, they went out and chose out these men, and then they brought them where? Did they just say, hey, you guys are now our deacons? Hey, you guys are now chosen our... our are our ordained deacons. Is that how it worked? No, they, they took the men and then they brought the men where? To the leadership, to the apostles, that they may what? Appoint them over this business. So who is the one that is making this judgment call? It's super clear. They have to first be brought to the apostles. Notice what it says further. Whom they set before the apostles and when they had prayed, watch this, and laid their hands on them. It says in verse uh, um, 7, And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem. So, notice what had to take place here. Who were they brought to? Who was the one that finalized this? Who was the one that made the ultimate decision here? The apostles. They were brought to the apostles. The apostles said, we are, gonna, we are going to appoint them to this position. They were brought, and notice also that when they were ordained, what took place? It says that they laid their hands on them, for what reason? To appoint them to this ministry or to appoint them to this office. And what office were they put into? They were put into the office of a deacon. I want you to turn with me now back to the Old Testament again. I want to show you that this took place also in the Old Testament over and over again. Numbers chapter number 27. Now, in uh, if we look at 1 Timothy chapter number 3 and Titus chapter number 1, what were given in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1? What did we see given? Qualifications, right? We saw qualifications that were given in 1 Timothy 3 
And in Titus chapter number one, who were they given to? A congregation? That's important. Who were they given to? They were given to Timothy and they were given to Titus, right? The qualifications were specifically given to Timothy and they were given to Titus. For what reason? Because Timothy was going to be the one ordaining these people into this office. Why? Well, why were they given to Titus? Because Titus was the one that was going to be ordaining someone into this office. So we see that the qualifications of the bishop and the deacon, when given through inspired scripture, who did God have Paul give them to? He had them, had them given to a man, not the congregation as a whole, but a man that had already been qualified to this position, just like we see in the Old Testament. Does it make sense that people that are unqualified, or even a person that is unqualified, would choose out someone else that is qualified for a position that they're unqualified for? It doesn't make any sense. Now, people say, well, you know, we can just get the majority to, to, to do this. We'll just have the majority in the church to take a vote on who's going to be put into this particular office. This is just a fact. The majority are often wrong. The majority in a church are normally babes in Christ. Most churches, if you go to a church, no matter how big it is, the majority of them are not that grown in Christ. Now, there are exceptions of this, of course, right? But the majority in most churches are not. Now, if we let's look at our church. Now, people in our church are pretty grown in Christ, I would say. But let's say this. What about in 10 years? What's going to happen to our church? If we, when people start growing, being added unto our church, what are we going to have in 10 years? Do you think the majority are just going to be grown fully Christians? You know, strength, you know, the, they, they're measuring, all of them are measuring up to the stature of Christ? Of course not, right? Most churches are going to have the majority of their churches are going to be babes in Christ. They're not going to be qualified. So we see in the Old Testament, when Moses was going to be appointing someone under him as officers and rulers, notice that the qualifications for that were given to Moses. You see in the New Testament, who made the judgment call in Acts chapter 6 ultimately? They brought them and, they, and it says that they set them before the apostles. What does that mean, they set them before the apostles? Are they in that position yet? No. When, does it, when is it finalized? When they ordain them by doing what? The method by which was laying their hands on them. And that is them formally being appointed in that office. So notice that those men being given authority, the deacons, had to come from where? From previous or existing authority. Did it or did it not? 1 Timothy chapter number 3. We're going to see that, of course, Timothy was ordained. We saw that we started in 1 Timothy 4. It said, by the, Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy. And then he says, By the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. So was there a time in which Timothy had the elders lay hands on him and he was appointed to an office? There was a time when he was appointed to an office, right? So does it make perfect sense that he then is qualified to appoint other people to this office? He then has the authority to appoint others to this same office. Same thing with Titus. So you have a man that is qualified, and he is appointing another man, and by his judgment he's saying this man's qualified. We look at 1 Timothy 3, we look at Titus 1. Another thing that we see there is we see things that could be considered uh, um, subjective, Right? A man that rules his house well. Now, you are going to draw that line at least somewhat in a different place than I am, aren't you? Not everyone, if we get really, really specific, not everyone is going to draw that line in the same place, are they? You know, if we look at all of the qualifications, not a novice. Now, are you going to draw that line somewhere different than I am? Now, if you look at people that, are, that you know, know the Bible, you know, what's going to happen is people that know the Bible less, well, they're... Uh, a conclusion of what a novice is is going to be very different than a person that knows the Bible a lot, a lot more, isn't it? You know, they're going to have the line bumped up a lot. So, why in the world, especially look, think about that one when it says not a novice. Why, how in the world would you expect a person or a group of people that are novices themselves you know, uh, to, to use their judgment and to be subjective with their judgment of not a novice to appoint other people in this position. Does that make any sense at all? So what is necessary? You need someone that is what? To make, uh, uh, that is 
To make the judgment of who's not a novice, what do you need? You need someone that's not a novice. You know what you need? You need someone that's already qualified to be a bishop or is already in the position of a bishop. Why? Because they have met the qualifications. They know what it takes. They know where you need to be in order to be in that position. They can look at someone that is ready and say, hey, that person can be put in this position. Because they know what it's like. They know what you have to go through. Now, there are some times when people are put into the position of a bishop where maybe they're not qualified. But you know what happens after a period of time? You know, and I'm referring to things like maybe not a novice. You know what happens after a period of time? They, even after being in that position for so long, they can look at another person and say, hey, when I was first ordained or put into this office, I wasn't ready. And by looking at you, I don't think that you're ready either. They still, after being and functioning in this office and now being qualified for this position, they can still look at the other person and their judgment is you know, uh, sufficient to be able to say, hey, you can be put into this office now. But for guideline purposes, what is supposed to be taking place is someone that has already met these qualifications, someone that is already not a novice, someone that has already knows what it's like to rule their own house well, they are the ones that are supposed to ordain another into this position. Same with Moses. Moses was an able man. He didn't give these qualifications to someone that was not an able man, someone that did not fear God, someone that you know didn't hate covetousness. You know what he gave it to? And those are all quali uh, qualities or characteristics that a ruler has to have. He gave it to someone that was already qualified to be a ruler. He gave it to someone that was already qualified with these particular characteristics. He already, they already had these characteristics. And they said, now you, since you're an able man, Moses, since you're a man that fears me, since you're a man that hates covetousness, I want you to go forth and find other men that are like you because I trust your judgment. That's the whole point of it. Titus 1, notice it's a man that's qualified. The apostles, what are they doing? They're putting someone into the position of a deacon. And the, the position of a deacon, if you notice the qualifications, they're identical to that of the position of, of a bishop, right? So an apostle who is the, in the office of a bishopric, of an overseer, if the qualifications are the same, wouldn't you say that they're qualified to ordain another person into that same office? Because what? They've already met those qualifications, haven't they? So you need this particular, you know, that's why it, it's authority that's given. Now, where does the authority come from? Where did the authority come from that was given to the apostles? So notice, remember, where we started in John 15, what did it tell us? He said, he chose them, he says, and I ordain them, and I ordain you, right? If we were to go to the, you know, we can look at uh, Luke, and we can look at uh, Matthew, the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of Matthew, where he, what does it say? He appoints 70 others also. What is he talking about? He appointed them, or he chose them, or he, what? Ordained them. Into the office of what? It's called a bishopric. An apostle. He put them into that office, didn't he? Right? So where did this authority come from to, that was given to the apostles? Where did the authority come from that the apostles had? came from Jesus, didn't it? It came from God. Now, does Jesus, does God have authority? So notice where the origin of the authority is. It comes from where? Authority. The authority comes from someone that is qualified themselves, Jesus, who is the, the, the shepherd and bishop of our souls, he is able to look and he is able to ordain other people that are qualified into this position. And who was it? He ordained, he chose to ordain the 12 and then 70 others also. And then what did they do when someone else had to be ordained into the church? Did just all the people that had never been ordained ordain them? No, who did it? They brought them to the apostles. Notice that. When someone else had to replace Judas, what happened? Who was it that was speaking amongst themselves? Who ended up ordaining them? Who ended up appointing them to that position? People that were already in authority themselves. And who was it? People that were qualified. It was the apostles, those that had been ordained themselves. Go back to the Old Testament. Even. The priests. Go to, actually, go, go with me to Numbers 27. Numbers chapter number 27. Did you, did you already turn there? I already announced that? Yeah. I did? Okay, Numbers chapter number 27. Let's go ahead and look at this. Now, we've read this a few different times, but it's all kind of overlapping. This will probably be the last sermon of this, of this somewhat unofficial mini-series on church leadership and how the church functions. And the reason why I just stayed on it, it's not just to be controversial, it's because it's super important. And I'm going to end today, 
you know, with the finality of why it is so important. You know, church leadership and the church structure is extremely important. So here in Numbers chapter number 27, you probably haven't memorized already, but look with me at verse number 15. Verse number 15, I want to point out here that this is something that is public and it is before the congregation. The ordination or the laying on of hands when someone is officially appointed is supposed to be public and take place before or in front of the congregation. Look at verse 15. And Moses spake unto the Lord, saying, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation, which may go out before them and which may go in before them, which may lead them out and which may bring them in. That the congregation of the Lord be not as sheep which have no shepherd. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take thee Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay thine hand upon him. So notice when this man is going to be appointed into the office of bishop or office of shepherd, what is he going to do? He says, and lay thy hand upon him. We're going to look at that more so. Uh, verse 19, it says this, And set him before Eleazar the priest, watch this, and before all the congregation. And watch this further. And give him a charge... In their sight. So notice that they're supposed to send them before the congregation. It says they're supposed to give them a charge in their sight. So how is this supposed to take place? In front of all the congregation. Look back at Acts chapter number 6. When the uh, deacons were ordained or appointed to the office, how did it take place? They, came, they brought them and they set them before the apostles. So who's there? Who's present? The congregation who brought them there, they themselves, and then what happens? The apostles lay their hands upon them in the presence of all. Keep reading. I'll further show this to you. Uh, verse 20, and thou shalt, this is the reason why, and thou shalt put some of thine honor upon him, that all the congregation of the children of Israel may be obedient. So it's, it's, it's important for everyone to see this person actually appointed to this office of authority so that they know, hey, this is now a ruler in the church. They are there when this person is officially put into this office. So that's important. That's the reason why it's meant to be public and why the congregation must be there. You can't just say, hey, I've actually heard of many churches doing this. Hey, Brother Elliot, I know you want to be a pastor, so we're actually going to have an ordination service with just me and you, and no one else is going to be here, and I'm going to take you, you know, up here, and no one's going to be here at all, and I'm going to ordain you and send you forth to be a bishop. That's not how it's supposed to work. The congregation is supposed to be present there at that time. Keep reading verse number 21. And he shall stand before Eleazar the priest, who shall ask counsel for him after the, after the judgment of Urim before the Lord. At his word shall they go out, and at his word they shall come in. Both he and all the children of Israel with him, even all the congregation. Verse 22. And Moses did as the Lord commanded him, and he took Joshua, watch this, and set him before Eleazar the priest, and before all the congregation. Verse 23. And he laid his hands upon him and gave him a charge as the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses. So how did this take place? He brought the new bishop or the new shepherd up there and he laid his hands upon him and he ordained him, right? He did. He ordained him or appointed him to this office by the laying on of the hands. And he also gave him a charge for what? for the new ministry or the new work that he was going to be doing. I want you to turn with me now. We're going to see that this takes place in many different times in the Old Testament. Go to uh, Leviticus, excuse me, chapter number 8. Leviticus chapter number 8. You'll see that the priests were also in front of the congregation ordained or, or put into this office of priesthood. Leviticus chapter number 8. Look, look with me at verse number 12. Well, actually, we'll read 1 through 12 real quick. And the Lord spake unto Moses, Leviticus 8 and 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take Aaron and his sons with him, and the garments, and the anointing oil, and a bullock for the sin offering, and two rams, and a basket of unleavened bread. And gather thou all the congregation together under the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So notice what has to happen. Gather all the congregation together. We're putting someone into a position of authority. It's coming from existing authority. And Moses, in authority, is about to ordain the next person in authority. So who put Moses into his position? Who gave the, the, the authority to Moses? God. God chose Moses. And then when other rulers were ordained, the 70, the 70 others were ordained, or the next bishop, who was going to be Joshua, who, who ordained and laid their hands on this? Moses did. Why? Because he had already been given authority from who? 
from God. Notice that authority has to come from authority. Right now, the, the uh, priesthood is considered what? An office. And people are, they need to be qualified and then they are appointed to this particular office. And who is going to be the one appointing them? Moses, who already has authority himself. Notice that the authority in every case, he goes to Moses. Why? Because he had already given this authority and appointed Moses to an office of leadership or authority. Verse 4. It says, And Moses did as the Lord commanded him, and the assembly was gathered together under the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Again, all the congregation is there when this person is appointed to this office. Verse 5. And Moses said unto the congregation, This is the thing which the Lord commanded to be done. And Moses brought Aaron and his sons and washed them with water. And he put upon them the coat and girded him with the girdle and clothed him with the robe and put the ephod upon him. And he girded him with the curious girdle of the ephod and bound it unto him therewith. So he actually gets them dressed in their attire of the priesthood. And he put the breastplate upon him. That's Aaron specifically. Also he put in the breastplate the Urim and the Thummim. And he put the mitre upon his head. Also upon the mitre, even upon his forefront, did he put the golden plate. The holy crown as the Lord commanded Moses. And then it says this in verse 10. And Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and all that was therein and sanctified them. And he sprinkled thereof upon the altar seven times and anointed the altar and all his vessels, both the laver and his foot, to sanctify them. Verse 12. And he poured of the offering, I'm sorry, he poured of the anointing oil upon Aaron's head and anointed him. And then it says this, to sanctify him. What does it mean to sanctify him? It means to set him apart. For what? He's setting him apart or consecrating him for this particular work. For this is the moment when he is actually put into the office. So notice something had to happen to set him apart or to sanctify him. Now, what is the anointing oil in the Old Testament? What does it represent in the New Testament? The Holy Ghost, right? It represents the Holy Ghost. Now, what happens when someone puts their hands on someone in the New Testament and ordains someone to an office? Or, or and, 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 and let me also say this, because I'm right now preaching about someone being ordained specifically into an office into the church and how that's supposed to take place. But there are, of course, times where people are ordained just to do a specific work. And it may not be into a specific office either at the church. That happens all the time. And you know what they do? They also lay their hands on this person. And what happens when they do it? It's meant to, that they would receive power from the Holy Spirit. They would receive power from the Holy Ghost. And that's what this picture is. Him laying his hands on them, getting them dressed, anointing the oil, right? He's, of course, laying his hands on them when he does that. What is it representing? It's representing the transmission or, or the conference of the Holy Ghost. The word conference means, you know, whereas, you know, transference, for something to be transfer means that it's leaving you and then going to someone else. Like, you don't have it anymore. If something's transferred from one place to another, that means it's leaving its, its previous de de uh, destination and going somewhere else, right? The word, you know, conference, to confer something, means that it, you know, like if I had, well, I couldn't do it with the Bible, right? It would be like this. If I laid my hands on, let's say, Brother Elliot and prayed for him to receive the Holy Ghost, is it like I've lost all power of the Holy Ghost and now he's leaving with the Holy Ghost and I'm just here, you know, as dead as a doornail? No, what happened was I conferred the Holy Ghost to him. Co means with. It's like both of us now. now I'm, I would be laying my hands on him and asking for the blessing from God and for God to bless also Brother Elliot with the Holy Ghost. That's what would be taking place, right? So that's the difference between to transfer and to confer, right? It means that you're giving it, but you still have it as well, whoever it may be, right? So that this is like the conference of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit being put on someone, and that is the whole purpose of the laying on of hands. It will always be a man that is in authority himself by the Holy Ghost, right? He is powered by the Holy Ghost, and then he is ordaining this other person into this office, or just, like we said, maybe for a work. They're receiving power from the Holy Ghost just to go and do that work, right? I want, I'm going to read to you from Jeremiah. You go to Numbers chapter number 20. I'm going to read to you from Jeremiah chapter number 1, verse number 5. Notice it said there, uh, like we read, that they were sanctified or consecrated, it said, and it also used the word set apart to this business. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5 says this, 
Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And then he says this, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. So notice there how he says he sanctified them and he ordained them, right? So to be ordained is to be sanctified. It means to be set apart. When did that happen with the priest? It's when he laid his hands on them and he poured the anointing oil and he got them dressed into this attire. When did that happen for uh, Joshua? It's when he laid his hands on them, right? When did that when did that happen for the when were the deacons set apart for that work? When were they sanctified for that work? It's when they were taken to the apostles, the apostles laid their hands on them, prayed over them, they received the Holy Spirit, and then now they are going forth and they're set apart or appointed to this specific office. So notice the ordination is very important because this is when someone receives power by the Holy Ghost. Uh, you're in Numbers chapter number 20. Numbers chapter number 20. I want you to look at me at verse number 25. So we saw there the anointing of Aaron and of all the priests, right? But Aaron actually dies before Moses does. Aaron dies before Moses does. And then what God has Moses do, because I want you to notice this. This is the importance of authority coming from authority. God has Moses take Aaron's son, Eleazar, and he anoints him again. Why doesn't he say, hey, Eleazar just now steps into Aaron's office? Now he's just, now it's just Eleazar in his position. Why? Because someone must be, like the apostle said, you must be ordained to this office or ordained into a position of authority. Look at Numbers chapter number 20, verse number 25. It says this, Take Aaron and Eleazar his son, and bring them up on the Mount Hor, and strip Aaron of his garments, and put them upon Eleazar his sons. Notice the transfer right now of authority from one to the next. It says, And Aaron shall be gathered unto his people, and shall die there. Now this is, of course, because Aaron was disobedient uh, to the Lord. This is why this is happening to him. Verse 27, And Moses did as the Lord commanded. Now watch this further. And they went up into the Mount Hor in the sight of all the congregation. Notice the consistency here that this is public. The congregation needs to know who the new uh, priest is, or chief of priests, right? It says, sight of all the congregation, and Moses stripped Aaron of his garments and put them upon Eleazar his son. And Aaron died there in the top of the mount. And Moses and Eleazar came down from the mount. And when all the congregation saw that Aaron was, was dead, they mourned for Aaron 30 days, even all the house of Israel. So it's so important that even when Aaron is about to die, God has Moses go and appoint or ordain or anoint, whatever word you want, uh, the new priest into this office. Notice that he had Moses go again. Why? Because authority is given from a position of authority or from a position of leadership. Go with me now to the New Testament. Go to 1 Timothy chapter number 4. 1 Timothy chapter number 4. 1 Timothy chapter number 4. This is actually where we began. 1 Timothy chapter number 4. I'm going to show you this further to you that uh, the authority that Timothy was given was from, the, from someone that had authority. Notice what it says in 1 Timothy chapter number 4. Look at verse number 14. So it says, neglect not the gift that is in thee. Now, what's the gift in the New Testament oftentimes? What do all the gifts come from? The Holy Ghost, right? So what do you think took place here? Of course, the laying on of hands. It tells us that. Look at verse 14. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy. And then it says this, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Now, the word presbytery, as I said, means Elder. I'm going to prove that to you. Go, I want you to go to 2 Timothy 1.6. And this further proves that elder is not just an older man. But specifically, an elder is someone in authority. It's referring to the position of an overseer, of a bishop. Now, what's the office of an apostle referred to as? Bishopric, right? In Titus 1, it says, you know, uh, that for this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I have appointed thee. Then he goes on a couple of verses down and says, for a bishop must be blameless. So he refers to the elder as a bishop. The apostles are referred to as, the office is referred to as a bishopric, right? 
So I want you to keep that in mind. A bishop being used interchangeable with an elder, right? And what does presbytery mean again? It means elder, the laying on of the hands of, an, of by the elder. Look at 2 Timothy chapter number 1. I want you to look at verse number 6. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God. Doesn't that sound familiar? That thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee. Now watch this. By the putting on of my hand. So what was 2 Timothy referring to? Or 1 Timothy, I'm sorry. 1 Timothy 4. It was referring to the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Right? And what does, what, who is the presbytery here? Well, Paul specifically says that it is him. That he was the one that laid his hands on Timothy. He was the one that actually put his hands on Timothy. What office was Paul in according to Acts 1? Bishopric, right? What does it say in Titus 1 again? Ordained elders? And then what does it say? For a bishop. So well, there, who did? if we use those two interchangeable... Who laid their hands upon Timothy? Well, an elder did. What else did? A bishop did. It's the laying on of the hands of the presbyter. So it was Paul that it's referring to when it actually says that he laid his hands upon Timothy. Now I want you to think about this further. It's always someone in authority. It's not just older people, right? Just aged men. Who laid their hands upon the uh, deacons, specifically? The apostles, the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. What was Paul? An elder. What is it referring to? It's referring to leadership. It's referring to the office of, if you will, the bishopric. It's referring to people that are in authority. People have debated about, well, what was Timothy? If he's able to ordain others into an office, what was Timothy? I don't know exactly what Timothy was, but I'll tell you from studying the Bible that Authority has to come from authority. And someone that is qualified for an office is someone that ordains someone and judges whether another is qualified for an office and ordains them into that office. Um, so Timothy could have been, I'll give you some possibilities, Timothy could have been a bishop. Timothy also could have been a prophet. That's very possible. But what we know is that Timothy was in a position of authority because he was qualified Here's the thing. Timothy was qualified for 1 Timothy 3. He wouldn't be giving you know, these qualifications to someone that's not qualified. Do you think you would have been telling him, hey, telling a novice, hey, make sure you ordain someone that's not a novice. Hey, make sure that you do this. Hey, make sure you do that when he himself is not qualified for this position, right? So he was also in a position of authority, whether it be prophet, whether it be pastor. Because remember, it's apostles, prophets. And then, you know, uh, yeah, apostles, prophets, and then pastors. So he could have been a bishop. He could have been a prophet. He could have been one of those two positions. But uh, we do know that he was in the position of authority. I want you to turn with me now, or I'll read to you. You go to 1 Timothy 3. We're going to end there in 1 Timothy chapter number 3 of why this is important. James 5.14, this also falls in with what the word presbytery means. It says this in James 5.14. Is any sick among you? Let him call the elders of the church and let them pray over him. And then it says this, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. So notice the anointing with oil again, with the laying on of the hands. They all tie in with one another. A person being, you know, receiving the Holy Spirit, receiving you know, a, a power or healing from the Holy Ghost. That's what that would be referring to in that case. That's not specifically someone being ordained into an office. But what it does tie in with there is... They are having the elders of the church come and anoint them or lay their hands on them. Just like Paul said to Timothy, the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Who was the presbytery? It was Paul. What was Paul? He was an apostle. He was in a position of authority. Every time someone lays their hands on someone and appoints them to an office, every time, it's always someone that's already in the position of authority. Authority in the local church does not just ever just come out of nowhere. You can't find it anywhere. It never does. The qualifications are already given to someone that already is within authority. This is very basic. It's very important. If someone is going to be given authority, they have to be given that authority from someone who already has authority. In the Old Testament, when the local church was established, God first chose the, the bishop and shepherd of that church, right? You know, he then selected the next one. And obviously God told him, hey, get Joshua. But he took him. It was his job to lay his hands on him. There was a time which God stepped back. 
And then they started using those guidelines and choosing the next man. God didn't choose every single priest according to Leviticus, you know, uh, was it 8? Leviticus 21. God didn't keep coming back and saying, hey, that guy's got a crooked back. Hey, that guy's a dwarf. He can't do it. Who was it left up to? Those that were already priests. It was left up to those that were already qualified. The priests were called the judges. They were supposed to use the law, right? And they were supposed to judge as well. They were also officers and judges. They determined who the next one was, right? So who started laying their hands on after that? Who was it? It would have been someone that was already inducted into this office, who already had a position of authority. When the deacons need to be added to the church, they brought them before the apostles who had already in a position of authority, and they laid their hands on them and appointed these men. Notice also in Acts 1, when they needed someone to be added in a position of authority in the office of Judas to replace them, what happened? They ended up appointing this person because they were qualified to do so. This is very basic. Uh, I want you to, you're in 1 Timothy 3, correct? Mm-hmm. So 1 Timothy 3, we, we read the first uh, three quarters of this chapter here with the qualifications of the bishop and deacon, which is referring to the offices. But then here in verse number 14, he says this, These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. So I want you to notice, he's saying, I'm writing these things unto you. He said, but I'm hoping to come unto you shortly. Now look at the very next verse, verse 15. But if I tarry long, so if I'm not there, I wrote these things for you. And he says this, this is why, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the church of the truth. I want you to notice what the church is referred to as there. What is it called? The pillar and ground of the truth. Does that sound important? It sounds extremely important, doesn't it? Amen. And he says it's the pillar and ground of the truth. And he says, I wrote these things unto you, and I'm hoping to come unto you shortly. But the reason why I wrote these, he says there, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. What's the reason for this chapter right here? What is given? The qualifications of the bishop and deacon. What is that? These are the guidelines of of a person that's going to be put in authority. What is it? It's a part of the structure of the local New Testament church. And Paul says, man, I wish I could be there right now. But I went ahead and I wrote these to you. It's important that you may know, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. Then he even more so stresses the importance. He says, which is the church of the living God. Notice that. The church of the living, the congregation of the living God. And then he says, the pillar and ground of the truth. He said, man, I am tired of hearing about church structure. Well, you know, luckily for you, I'm pretty sure I'm finished after this service. But it's extremely important. It's the church of the living God. It's the pillar and ground of the truth. And we need to know why we believe certain things. Why does a person, why does a bishop ordain another person? Because every time we see someone ordained, it's someone that's already in position of authority. Every time. This is the pattern throughout the Bible. When someone's put into an office in the church, they are put into that office by someone who's already in an office in the church. Does that make sense to you? You know, the bishop and the deacon are both the offices of the church. They both have the same exact qualifications in the New Testament, right? And they both are given authority. They're, the deacon even has authority. That's why he's, all, he's given the same qualifications, and it even talks about him ruling his own house well. Why? Why did he tell you about the bishop? Because he, you know, if, he, if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God, right? So the bishop obviously is over the deacon, He is the overseer of the deacon of the church, and he is the boss of the deacon, if you will, as well, because he's the man that's set over the congregation. But there's also authority there as well, isn't there? And that authority comes from where? It comes from existing authority. Timothy already had someone lay hands on him. Titus already had someone lay hands on him and put him into an office of authority, and he's given qualifications because he's already qualified. Same thing with Moses. Everyone that's put into an office, that person, the person that puts them into an office, had authority. And where does authority come from? Every time we trace it back, where does it come from? From God. God gives the authority, He gives the guidelines, and then He steps back. Man use the, uses those guidelines and those qualifications, and then He, according to His judgment, puts the next person 
into that next office. So we need to understand why we do things, why we believe what we believe. We need to understand why the church functions the way that it is, why we have the particular structure that we have in the church. These things are very, very important. Paul said, you know, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. What is that referring to? Of course we can say, hey, you know, we should be, you know, having strobe lights and rock and roll music up here, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. But what's he talking about when he says this? He's talking about how you're going to have your church structure. He's talking about how you're actually going to run things within the church is what he's talking about. He's talking about the authority structure of the church. That is important in knowing how we're going to behave ourselves, how we're going to work together, right? And as we see every time in the Bible, you know, things need to be done decently and in order. God has a specific order. We don't need to be reinventing things. We want God to bless our church. Therefore, we need to do things the way that we see them laid out. And, and put forth in the Bible. Let's fire eyes and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the consistency from the Old Testament to the New Testament, dear Lord. There's not these, these vast differences where we just need to omit a ton of stuff and add a ton of stuff, dear God. When there are changes, it's clear, dear Lord. And, and as I said, we're just thankful that there's this continuity from beginning to end, how we can learn so much from the word of God. We thank you, dear Lord. Uh, for the institution of the church. We thank you for the great fellowship. I ask you that you would be with uh, Brother Rick, that you would uh, heal him, dear Lord, and that you would give him comfort. And uh, uh, we ask you that you'd be with anyone else maybe that's having any kind of trial, tribulation, or anything in our church. Just bless all those that are in our church. And we uh, thank you for, as I said, the brethren. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen. amen.